Welcome back to Virtualizing Your Data Center with Hyper-V and System Center. I'm Simon Perryman, and I'm joined again by Matt McSpirit. And we're not really going to focus on continuing to optimize this virtualization platform, kind of move away from these traditional host virtualization concepts more into this model of private cloud. So what exactly is private cloud? For us, it's a way for us to pool all of our resources. It's a way to make them easily reusable, standardized, automated, pulled together. And so you're going to now start to see us use Virtual Machine Manager as this object, as this utility to manage our private cloud resources. We're going to start by talking about virtual machine templates and service templates. Well, first of all, what exactly is a template? A template is our predefined collection of objects. A template could be used for a particular piece of a virtual machine, such as defining the guest operating system's hardware profile. So the virtual processes, the virtual memory, the virtual disk connections. We have operating system configuration, being able to configure the roles and the settings, application configuration, and SQL configuration. You know what? Let's just jump straight to our demo and kind of walk you through what each of these building blocks really mean. I'm going to switch back over to my, uh, my System Center Virtual Machine Manager host, kick Matt off it here. And from VMM, we are going to start working in what we call the library workspace. Again, the library is where we've gone and collected all of those objects that we're going to reuse and redeploy. So within the library, I have what we call our library service. These are our Windows Server file services. And you can see from here that we already have a lot of objects that we've added. The different types of objects vary. We can manage custom resources. We can manage PowerShell scripts, such as the one which Matt created earlier with the ability to you know, easily jump in, view a file. We have the ability to manage SQL DAC packs, so data tier application packages, and a variety of other types of scripts, and of course, our virtual hard disks. But let's actually look at our profiles here. Now, first type of profile we're going to look at is this hardware profile. Now, for our hardware profile, let's take a look at our dev VM hardware profile. We're going to go and essentially define all of these settings, kind of the same type of uh, layout that you might see from Hyper-V Manager when looking at the settings of a VM, or even through System Center VMM looking at these settings, where we can go and configure our processes, our memories, and our disk connection. Down here, you get those same high availability features as well, including your virtual machine prioritization, CPU prioritization, memory prioritization, etc. So this is essentially defining the virtual hardware. Let's take a look at the virtual guest operating systems that we have. In fact, we could go ahead and just go and create a new guest OS profile here. What we're going to do is provide it with a name. So we'll call this Contoso Guest OS. Click on our guest OS profile settings, and then pick our operating system, our identity information. So maybe we use Contoso star star to generate some wildcard characters administrative information, product keys, and time zones. But this is where you're going to save a lot of time, pre-configuring our features and roles before we go into production. We're probably going to need our .NET framework, and we might want to go and set this up as maybe an Active Directory virtual machine, applying various features, various roles. We could join it to the domain, and we can run some pre-configured answer files or run one commands. So the first time you boot this VM, if you need some customization done, it executes this script and configures those additional settings. We'll click Save, and this is going to generate our guest operating system profile. So we now have the virtual hardware and the virtual guest operating system. But what if we wanted to go and add some SQL Server components, if this virtual machine is going to run a SQL Server? Well, we wanted to save on the SQL Server configuration setup costs. And so we can templatize some of these settings as well, such as who is an administrator to the SQL Server? What type of security are they going to use? What's the different run as accounts? How are they going to connect it? We can even go and add a SQL Server configuration file if we want to go and do some additional configuration. We get to include the different service accounts we're going to run. And then kind of the traditional SQL information, the instance name, instance ID. So what this essentially means is, if we're deploying a SQL Server within this VM, we can apply this profile and configure that SQL Server to use these settings. We also have what we call an application profile as well. Let's take a look at this application profile here. 
for our web application. Similar to the SQL profile, this allows us to pre-configure other Windows service features and roles. We could go and add a SQL DAC pack. We can add an app v application. We can add a web application, and then some additional scripts. So in this case, we've gone and pre-configured our web application. So we know how it's being deployed, and we know what are the different settings that are assigned, giving us the ability to even go and adjust these settings if we need to. We then have a post-installation script and a pre-installation script that we can run to ensure that this web application is set up correctly. And you can have lots of those. If you click on the, uh, the Add button in, within that wizard, you can have lots of scripts executing as part of this particular, um, in this case, application profile. So if you think back to what we were talking about before when we built the logical switch, the logical switch was essentially the combination of lots of building blocks, like a hardware profile, in this case, hardware profile, guest OS profile, application profile. So a template, a VM template, is essentially a combination of those building blocks. That's right. So let's take a look at exactly what this VM template looks like here. So we're going to go and select our VM template for the virtual machine here. So as I go and open this up, I get these same settings that we just configured. So my hardware configuration maps back to my hardware profile. OS configuration, OS profile, applications, SQL servers. So you see we've taken these individual building blocks, put them together to now create a fully functional virtual machine. We can still continue to add custom properties, change different settings, dependencies, and validate that the configuration is going to work. Now let's go back to the presentation, and we'll kind of take you through this next step of why we're building these templates and how they're going to work together. This is essentially the next layer, a collection of VMs that we now call a service template. So as we start to really look at our enterprise customers, we realize that their applications don't just run in a single VM. They need a collection of VMs that are often defined by multiple tiers. Generally, we see kind of the backend data tier that has connection to the SQL database. It's often clustered, clustered virtual machines, so you have that SQL guest clustering built in. We have our application tier that may include some business processing, web servers, basically serve as a conduit between the data and our end users doing customized business logic. And then we have our web tier, which is kind of our front-end portal, front-end website, where we're allowing our clients to come in. Now, the advantage of managing these as a single logic or unit as a service is we can start them all up, shut them down, and scale out as a single logical management unit. So as you kind of take a look back at our service template, we've now gone from having these tiers to just managing them as objects. So managing our web tier, our application tier, our data tier. We actually build these by going through our service template designer. It's going to give us the ability to actually customize and lay out all these different components. Let's go and actually take a look at this in action. So over here, I'm now going to click on a service template and select Create a Service Template. This is going to launch our designer, and it's going to give me an option to go and pre-configure some multi-tier applications. In this case, let's just go and select a simple two-tier application. We'll call this Pet Shop Service Template. We'll say this is our 1.0 release. Click OK. And then within our service template designer, it's going to give us some containers that are essentially a template for how we're going to go and build this application. This just going to take a minute to complete. And what it's essentially doing is giving us these separate buckets given us the ability to go and inject the various virtual machines throughout this configuration here. All right, our template is now loaded. I'm just going to maximize the service template designer here, resize the view. Oh, we'll just wait for this to finish loading. And you'll see down here, we, or on the left, we have our different service templates, and we have settings at the bottom. So let's take a look at our service template here. We get a prioritization. We're going to bump this up to high. I'm going to select my first tier here. And this is going to be my web tier. So I'm going to take my web tier, drag it over, drop it. And this means that this particular template will now be deployed into this tier. When I go and reselect this template, I now get some additional information I can configure. I have the name that I can adjust, description. And then I have this application deployment order and servicing order 
meaning that I want to start this first or I want to start it second. In this case, we're going to go and start our web tier second. We're going to use our backend tier as our primary tier. The next configuration option on the right here is scaling out. So by default, we're going to start with one VM in this tier, and it's going to scale out to up to five virtual machines. But we can adjust this. Maybe I want to go and configure some type of load balancer up front. In this case, I'm going to select my default instance count for two virtual machines. So I'm always going to have a pair deployed in this tier. Now, if we wanted to go and configure load balancing, we'd have that ability if we've uh, added some load balancers to our, um, to our virtual machine manager. In fact, Windows Server network load balancing does come available in the box as a role that you can deploy. So it's simple for you to go and add one of our inbox load balancers and include that as part of our service template. For simplicity, we're going to skip the load balancing here. Let's go and select our second application, our backend data tier, drag and drop, and place this here. And you can see that this is pre-configured with all of our various SQL Server settings. Well, let me zoom out a little bit, and we'll go and see how we can adjust these different networks. So here you can see that my virtual NICs have been created. They're attached to the various tiers. We've got the LANs configured. We've got our virtual network configured. And we've got all of our settings available here. So this is essentially how we're combining these applications. We can then save this application. It's going to go validate it, make sure that this, in theory, will work. Now, in some cases, I think for this particular application, we may not have uh, included a uh, virtual hard disk. So in real production, this may not be the most efficient way to deploy it. But this sample basically gets you through these configuration steps. Now, while this is being saved, I'm going to switch back over to my demo and quickly talk about service updates. Now, when we think about this service, how we manage it, we can, uh, everything is based on this template. So rather than update a VM, we can actually update our templates and have those changes then applied to the VMs. And this way, since we're updating our single centralized source of information and pushing out those changes, we're going to ensure that those changes get applied to each of the individual services that we've deployed. And we don't have to manually go into each one and make this post configuration change. So we could do in-place updates, which basically means we're updating the template itself, so maybe changing the memory settings. Or we could just go and replace the entire operating system image. Now, within our virtual machine manager, they have servicing order, service independences, so a lot of granularity in how you can actually go and build those different configurations. Well, with that, I'm gonna, uh, we're going to wrap up this module. We're going to move on, and we're going to start to talk about our private clouds and our user roles. So Matt, give us this definition of why user role management is important when we start to think about private clouds. <laughs> so if you think about private clouds, when we're essentially what we're doing from a VMM perspective with private clouds is we're aggregating all of our capacity, which when we've got two hosts and only a bit of storage, it's not that exciting. But if you've got a bigger infrastructure, you can aggregate and pool all of your storage, your compute capacity, and abstract it into effectively resource pools that we call clouds. And then from there, use the user roles capability to actually allocate and, and assign those clouds to different groups of users. So for instance, remember when we, we created our development LAN, our VM network earlier on? We could create a development cloud that then attaches to the development LAN so that these guys could have a, a set of resources within a, a boundary. So we define those, and we're going to show that in, in demonstration shortly. We define that boundary. We assign a group from Active Directory or individual users, and then we allow them to build VMs on that development VM network. So all these constructs come together, and that user role granularity is important to allow us to allow different users to have different experiences through self-service or through VMM's console itself and access their virtualized resources in the most efficient way. That's a really long-winded answer to your question <laughs> there, but the demonstration will help with that as well. So when we think about our um, environment and what we're talking about with clouds, conveniently, we've got development and production needs within the environment. We've got a couple of data centers in this example here, data center one, data center two. And what we want to do is effectively group together resources in such a way that abstract the detail from the kind of users we want to provide private cloud to, which they're not necessarily as interested in NIC speed and 
spindles and SSDs and all of that cool stuff that, that we love and get excited about. They just want a platform, some capacity to run their workload that's important to them. So by aggregating those and presenting them in logical clouds, remember our logical network construct we talked about before, this abstraction of the detail into something that's a bit more meaningful and specific. We abstract those into clouds and then we present those clouds through to different groups. And within those clouds, we deploy specific workloads and delegate capacity to different users. So it might be that within the production cloud, you've got different users accessing different resources that they need, or same in the development cloud as well. So you've, you've really got that flexibility to aggregate and capacity and pull it all together and present that out to your, your different users and deploy those services like Simon showed before, that service template, we could make that available to some of these different users. So the development team can always deploy a standardized web and data service that they want to develop against. So by giving them the service template rather than a collection of independent VMs, it speeds things up for them. Whenever they need a new environment, they just click new service template, gets deployed, and they have the web and data tier ready for them to start developing against. And it's in that isolated VM network so that they can work in isolation and not conflict with the other guys who are developing in their own web and data tier applications. Now in creating clouds, I'll walk you through this in, in VMM specifically, but it's a really easy wizard. You're specifying the resources that the cloud is going to use, so the host groups, your clusters, your underlying resources. There's also some VMware specific integration there if you're using VMM to manage a vSphere infrastructure, bringing in your resource pools if you use that functionality in the vSphere environment. You select your logical networks. Remember we built a logical network earlier on today. That logical network is going to be utilized by the cloud, so it's going to enable some connectivity. Any storage that you want to make available from a classification perspective, and then any specific capacity amounts. And once you've built your cloud, you're then into the realms of delegating access to that through role-based administration, of which there are a number of different types of users that we can provide different levels of administrative access. There's a read-only administrator who can pretty much not do much, but can at least get some visibility into certain host groups and certain clouds. Very useful for a help desk type user. You've got a self-service user, which as the name suggests, you've got self-service experiences for deploying VMs. They are only scoped to cloud specifically. They can build templates specific to their cloud. They can deploy and manage VMs and services from the templates like Simon showed. They can share resources and they've got a, a certain quota assigned to them as an individual level. Beyond that, there's something called a tenant admin. So when you define a cloud, imagine you're a service provider and you've just onboarded a new customer. The customer themselves, they, they, may have, they may want access to their cloud, but you may want to give access to that cloud to a broad set of that customer's users. They can be self-service users. However, in the same time, you may want one of your or a few of your customer's administrators to have a bit more control over that cloud. And that's what the tenant administrator could really provide. So you've got a tenant and a tenant admin there from that customer. And in that respect, they can, again, only manage clouds, but they can start to do a little bit more granular control and management of those clouds than what would be exposed to the self-service user. When we go a bit further still, you've got the delegated admin, the second in command. A delegated admin is a fabric level admin. They can configure host networking and storage, create clouds, and they're scoped to host groups and clouds. So they're one step down from the full administrator of which they have complete control. They can control any action that VMM is capable of taking, and they have complete scope across clouds, Hyper-V host directly, and so on. So you've got a broad spectrum of, of capability there. So it's probably worth diving in to the demo environment that you've, uh, I need to sign back into. Now, you know, I, I often get asked, what is the most logical way to go and create these clouds? You know, how do people, different organizations, actually structure them and organize them? Well, we see a couple different models. We see people organize clouds based on the technology or the capability. So maybe there's an engineering cloud that has your fastest servers, and then human resources cloud that's, you know, a little gloomy, the old hardware on it. We also see people divide them based on geographic locations. Data center one is cloud one. Data center two is cloud two. We also see people break them down based on project. I used to run a lot of uh, uh, actual hosting lab, and for each day when we had you know, 50 students, 500 VMs, that would be its own private cloud. So within that little cloud, we would give the instructor the ability to go adjust things to scale up, but we only gave him a little amount of capacity that he could scale up, so he wasn't consuming information from any of our other end users. 
bottom line is clouds can be used to organize and manage in a lot of different ways, just like host groups in VMM. The distinction you want to make between the host group and the cloud is that the cloud is for our end user. It abstracts that underlying hardware. Host group is for our IT staff, where they still need to figure out the individual servers and the individual clusters. So with our cloud, that's our layer of abstraction for our end users. Correct. Now, the first thing we're going to do in, this, in the part of this demonstration is we're going to create a, a role for our, as Simon said, our end users. So what we have on the screen here, we're back in VMM, good old VMM. And I'm in the user roles uh, option here within the settings uh, view. And I'm going to create a user role for our development guys. So in this case, we created our development LAN before the new VM network. We've got a couple of v we've got a VM on there as well now. So I'm going to call this one development um, users. I think that's fine. We'll go next. The profile of this particular user is going to be a self-service user, an application admin. All they're interested in consuming is a couple of VMs specific to them that they can administer. They're not interested in the fabric necessarily. They just want an environment to do some work in. So we'll go next. Now the members of this are going to be dev user, hopefully as an AD user. Yep, there we go. So just one person, but it could be a group of people. And the scope, at this stage, they've no cloud. So they've got no scope to actually have any actions upon for now, but we'll change that a bit later on. We'll go next. And in terms of VM networks, each member of this user role, i.e. the development users, can use only these specified VM networks. We're going to let them deploy VMs only onto the development LAN. Makes sense. I mean, that's the environment that we're going to provide for them, no other needed. And when I click Next, we get to choose what resources they can consume. What can they deploy from? What can they provision? And in that case, we want to keep their provisioning consistent. So I'm going to use... Is this your service template you created here, Pet Shop service template? It is. I jumped ahead we, and uh, we pushed it out and it. it. It's complete and it works. We'll go for it anyway. OK. And you'll see that now this means that my development team of Pet Shop, they're going to have a consistent web and data application, if you will, across two VMs or maybe three VMs, since you put two for the web tier, uh, whenever they deploy. So each, each time they deploy a new instance of this service, it's going to be an extra three VMs deployed into the cloud. Um, Anything else we need to do? I don't think there's anything more. We don't need any, anything else, I don't think, from a resources perspective. I might give them one or two more bits just in case. I'll give them our VM template that we created just in case. So we'll go next. And now any permissions. These are global permissions for this user role. So you might say, well, all they can do for this global user role is they can deploy VMs from a template only. They can be local admin on the machine. They can pause and resume. They can have a remote connection, shut down. In fact, let's scroll down a bit. So these are global actions. No matter what cloud they get given, they would be able to perform these particular actions. So start, stop, remote connection. I think that's fine for now. And then finally, any run as accounts that they may need to do their job, specifically, i.e. permissions that may, they may not have natively as their own credentials, but may need for some specific virtualization related function, will give them some credentials. They'll not know the VMM admin's credentials. They won't know that they've got access to them, but we give them them in case the system needs them on their behalf. So that, in a nutshell, has now created our user role, our development user. So now we can actually build a cloud for those development teams to consume. Now, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be so easy if there was just a Create Cloud button that just simplified all this stuff? We agree. And there's <laughs> our Create Cloud button just at the top here. So I'll create cloud button. I'm going to create a uh, development oh, cloud. There we go. And the resources this is going to consume is going to be our host group here. So it's going to have a certain amount of CPU memory disk available. Now, the logical networks this is going to sit on in, in terms of the virtual machines are going to sit on top of this logical network and use network vert. We're going to use Contoso LAN. We haven't got any load balancers that are configured optimally, nor therefore any VIP virtual IP templates. Classifications, we're going to choose low, because these are just dev machines. That's not necessarily that important. I might choose medium just to give them a little bit more. And I'm going to choose my standard Contoso port as well, which means when they deploy VMs through self-service, they're at least going to have three choices they can make for their VM deployment. If I chose bad and with low, it would be a little bit harsh, but there you go, that's me. I'll go next. Storage. Instead of saying SSDs, HDDs, capacity, etc., specific, very specific nuts and bolts, 
we just want to present that classification to these users. So we're going to let them deploy VMs onto, we'll let them have the silver tier, we'll also give them gold tier actually, feeling generous. But that means when they deploy VMs, they'll be able to choose one of those tiers and it will deploy accordingly. I imagine they're always going to choose gold, but there you go, that's up to them. They're both using the same file share, so it doesn't really make a difference in our environment. But once we've done that, we've got our library. Do I want to allow them to store anything or use any uh, library shares? Well, no, for the time being, this is fine. They don't need any access to that. And I'm going to untick these because I don't want to give them maximum capacity. I'm going to let them create a maximum of, um, let's choose four virtual, pro in fact, I'll choose six virtual processors. How much memory? Let's give them a maximum of one gig of memory. Storage, we'll give them 200. Custom quota, leave us 10. And custom quota is just a, a numerical value you can give to not only the capacity, but also you can give a numerical value to templates. Like one of your templates may be worth one point. Another template that's slightly more powerful, you may give three points. And in that respect, if you give the whole group 10 points, then you're only going to be deploy three of the three pointers and one of the one pointers, for instance. You know, you've got to allocate your 10 points accordingly. Now, in terms of the number of VMs, I'll just choose four for that. And the final one, capability profiles. What, hyper, what hypervisor platform is going to be applicable to this cloud? Now, for us, it's Hyper-V, so only Hyper-V VMs and templates are going to be able to be deployed into that environment. So we'll go next, and we'll go finish. And just like that, we've created a cloud. Easy peasy. So now, we can assign that cloud to a certain group. So assign cloud by right-clicking, and we're going to choose our development users because that's the only one we've got. So we'll go OK. And that will then assign that cloud to that group. And notice we've popped in right into development users groups. Now, we've, instead of going into settings like we had to before, it's opened up that specifically. It's ticked the box for cloud. And if we go to quotas for development cloud, I'm going to untick all of these to ensure that our users are assigned a very specific quota. So that is all fine. And in fact, for one individual user, I'm going to say that you can only define two and in fact, three VMs. And I'll let them do three processors. So one person can't consume everything, basically, which is handy. Now, from a permissions perspective, you'll see I've now got this cloud option that I didn't have before, this development cloud and I can apply certain specific permissions within that. So on a cloud by cloud basis, I might add the save option. And I may give them, I think that's all I'll give them for now. So those are grayed out because they're global. The extra permissions I can add, I can add here as well. In this case, I'm going to choose save. And that is me done from a creating the cloud and assigning it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually go to file in VMN, open new connection. And I'm going to sign in as, yep, you guessed it, dev user, and go password. Put that in there. Hopefully, that's the same password. And what that's now going to do is present me another view of VMM. Let me minimize this one out of the way for now, that is specific to this person. Now you're saying, well, I don't want to give them console access. Do they install a console on their workstation? What's happening here? Well, you could. You could give them the VMM console if you want. Alternatively, they could come in through self-service, and we'll touch on that when we get back to the slides in a minute. But notice I, as this dev user, I do not have a fabric view. I've not got a fabric option here, and that's not appropriate to me. When I look at clouds, all I've got is my development cloud. I can't create a service. I can't create a cloud. It's very, very scoped specific to me as a development user in, in this example, the way we've scoped it. So I'm going to go to my create VM, create virtual machine. And what you'll see is if I try and create a new VM from a blank virtual hard disk, I'll go next. I'll give it a name. I'll go next. And I'll try and click next again. Fail. You do not have permission. So I can't, as this user, create VMs to whatever specification I want to. Instead, I can only create from templates. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cancel out of here. I'm going to go to my library, which is where my templates are stored. And you'll see, I don't see the profiles that Simon talked through before, because then they've not been exposed to me. I just see my template. And there's the service template that hopefully is 
uh, correct and all working. So what I'm going to do as this dev user, configure a deployment, I'm going to call this one Pet Shop 1.0. I'm not sure if this will work all the way through because I didn't see all of your settings you made at the end, but we shall give it a go. We're now in the deployment wizard. I'm not sure whether this will go through, but we can refresh the preview. Here we go. And we'll get, because you've got two web servers now, it might, might blow the allowance, but we shall see. So this is the, the view. Oh, no, we've not got enough placement errors. So we need to investigate why that is a, a particular placement error. But as a user, I could look at this. I could use this tool. Yeah, so we've, I've not got enough memory in my cloud capacity. So we're going to use too much memory for this particular configuration. So I'd need to adjust these, these templates a little bit, which I'm not going to do now. But let's assume that that all went five stars. Everything was great. Everyone was having a great time. We would say deploy service. And what would happen, VMM would deploy, in this case, pet SQL 02, pet web 03, pet web 04 out onto the hosts. I don't know which host, because at the end of the day, I'm not deploying as a dev user to hosts. I'm deploying into the cloud. That could be two hosts under the covers there. It could be 50 hosts. I don't know that. All it's telling me is that I'm not I've not got a suitable cloud at this point in time based on the configuration I've got. So I would need to make a few tweaks there. But it's all abstracted away from the devs. I don't know which host it's sitting on, where it is in the infrastructure. It's just deployed onto those hosts. And because it's using network virtualization, those VMs could be completely scattered across that physical fabric. And it doesn't matter. They still communicate and they still be isolated from all of the other VM networks that we created. And that pretty much brings us to the end of, of the private cloud um, configuration. It's that easy. It's relatively straightforward. You saw how easy it was to create a cloud and how easy it was to assign roles and responsibilities there uh, through VMMs intuitive wizards, not only for permissions at a global level, but also, as we can see on the slide, permissions at a scoped level on a cloud-by-cloud -cloud basis. And this was newly introduced in 2012 R2 VMM. So it certainly brings a, a lot of advantages. And then when we think about consuming those clouds, what you'll see is when we talk a bit about App Controller a bit later on, I can use System Center App Controller as a way to log in as using my dev user credentials, if we use that example, I can log in with my dev user credentials. All I will see is that cloud, and I could deploy the same service template that I saw me deploy a few or tried to deploy a few minutes ago, except I'm not having to use the VMM console. So if you want to give your devs access to an environment, and what you can see on the screen here is a, a connection window in the browser through to um, the virtual machine that's running on the shared infrastructure within the dev environment, I can do that. And I can do it all through VMM in combination with App Controller. So when I log in as that user, I see my cloud, I see my capacity, and I only see the things that I can deploy, the templates, the service templates. And I can only perform the actions that you've let me uh, choose to perform. So that pretty much brings us to the end of, of clouds and, and deploying into clouds and configuring VM roles. So over to you for System Center. All right. Well, now we're going to be kind of thinking about more than just Virtual Machine Manager. You know, we talked a little bit about App Controller, but I'm going to kind of walk you through all of the different System Center components that touch Hyper-V. Now, as we developed System Center, they did start out as these individual products. But with the latest releases, System Center 2012, it's now bundled together as the single product with these individual components. So you kind of want to think to this as like Windows Server now. It's a single product. Within it, you get Hyper-V, you get file services, you get clustering. But it's still a single product. System Center is like that now. Within the System Center product, you get VMM, Operations Manager, App Controller, and a whole lot more. Now, with the release of these as the single product, there's been a lot of enhancements around their integration across the different systems. So we're going to get a chance to kind of explore how a lot of these different systems fit together as well. So first, let's go back to this view that we covered uh, as we kind of kicked off the session here, talking about System Center for the data center, specifically System Center and how we want to think about it with Hyper-V. We have our Hyper-V hosts managed by Virtual Machine Manager with connections to App Controller for administration, Operations Manager for monitoring, Service Manager for self-service, Orchestrator for automation, and Data Protection Manager to back up and restore our virtual machines. So we kind of talked a little bit about App Controller already. Let's just go straight into our demo and view it in action. Now, what I'm logging into here, I'll quickly show you my environment. We're now switching over from the environment that we've been using up to today to a full system center environment that I've built. 
This contains every single system center component, every one, including configuration manager, and even system center advisor. So bonus points out there if you guys know what system center advisor is. If you don't, go to systemcenteradvisor.com, get it for free. It's basically a best practice analyzer for your infrastructure, including Hyper-V and SQL, to make sure it's configured correctly, deployed correctly. And one more time, it is completely free. You do not even need to have a system center license for this, systemcenteradvisor.com. Now, with this lab, one thing that I want to point out here is, yes, it's fully virtualized. We often get asked, can I virtualize this component or this component or this component? Yes, you can. You can virtualize Virtual Machine Manager even. So you have a lot of flexibility in really how you want to configure this on bare metal or running up uh, in a virtualized environment. Well, let's go and switch over to App Controller here. Now, App Controller is a web interface. This gives us the advantage of being able to log in and connect to App Controller from any of our computers. We don't need to go and install a management console. As you look down the left, you get an overview, which basically tells you all the different services that you have access to. When you click on Clouds, we could create connection to Clouds. We can view the services we have access to, virtual machines that are running, and even access our library on the back end. So you can essentially see uh, App Controller as a uh, mechanism for self-service for our end users. But there are other different self-service components within System Center. We really want to think about using App Controller for our VM provisioning and VM management. Because with App Controller, we can deploy not just to our own cloud, our private cloud, but we can also deploy up to Windows Azure. We could also deploy to a third-party hoster, what we call a service provider cloud. And this is one of the strengths that Microsoft's trying to put together, this consistency of experience, regardless of whether you're running your VM in your own cloud, on Microsoft's cloud, or with a third-party cloud. Well, let's jump back to the presentation here. We've quickly covered App Controller. And now App Controller and Azure. So we did mention that we have access to this public cloud. Let's talk a little more about what this means. Now, Windows Azure, if you haven't used it before, it's basically the public cloud that Microsoft offers. You get pre-configured services, such as websites, virtual machines, SQL databases, and then even different types of services for developers, like Visual Studio in the cloud, or mobile services that allow you to have push notifications. So a lot of this is just pre-configured available for you. So how does this fit in with your private cloud? Well, we want to think of the ability of using this to extend your data center. We can connect up our on-premise environment to Windows Azure using site-to-site -site VPN so that we can get single sign-on authentication built directly through our different systems. So you can continue to use your same Active Directory infrastructure federated up to Windows Azure and maintain security and consistency. You get good views of how your different virtual machines are running and functioning. Now, this is where the integration happens with App Controller. We can give you the ability to go and deploy a VM up to that Azure cloud. We essentially give you access to your libraries of virtual machines, all of the different templates, including custom templates that you can upload, push it out, and you've got it deployed. Next, we're going to talk about System Center Operations Manager. Operations Manager is used for real-time monitoring. This could be used for alerts, errors, events, and even checking things like performance, seeing how well different applications are running. It's highly extensible. We have this concept known as management packs that allow us to essentially look for specific metrics or registry keys or events for a particular application. So for example, if you wanted to run SQL Server, monitor that with Operations Manager, you would have the management pack for SQL Server. Basically, the way Operations Manager works is we deploy what we call agents on each of the hosts that we monitor. Those agents send information back to the centralized Operations Manager server. And then based on the different management packs, Operations Manager analyzes that information, figures out what type of data is relevant, what it should create an alert with, and then goes and shares it with our administrators. It also has a lot of built-in knowledge. So when there's an alert, we also include best practices as far as how you can actually go and resolve the alert. And we have some rich topology views, giving you the ability to drill down across multiple layers to really try to find the root cause of any type of performance problem, from the conceptual layer of an enterprise service to its different clouds, its different servers, its different virtual machines, 
all the way down to the uh, individual pieces of physical or virtual hardware. Let's take a quick look at Operations Manager in action. So I'm just going to switch over my virtual machines and go and launch my Operations Manager virtual machine. Now, within Operations Manager, first thing that we take a look at here are what we call our active alerts. Our active alerts are basically going to summarize any type of problem that we have in our running environment. It's going to be able to filter them based on criticality. Are, you know, how severe are they? Is it informational? Is it a warning? How quickly should you fix it? Once you have these different alerts, you have different ways to go and manage them as well. Assign them to different people, to different user roles. So for example, it looks like I'm having an issue with my Active Directory site here. We're going to wait for this, uh, this alert to load. Once it loads, we can go manage it. We can view the different knowledge, the potential root causes of this issue. And then we also have the ability to go and even assign it to different users or different people here. So it's saying more than 60% of the domain controllers are reporting a health problem. All right, well, let's investigate this in a little more detail here. Down here, we can change the alert status to assign to engineering. We can assign it maybe to our developer. Actually, this is probably going to be more likely our uh, tier one support. They have the information. We can click assign this to them. Click OK. And now, depending on the, uh, our backend services, we can automatically assign this bug to that individual user based on things such as TFS or integrating with other types of project management systems. So we're collecting the information, figuring out how to repro it, including knowledge information, and then assigning it to someone to resolve. So we're not just coming at them and saying, hey, there's a problem. We're saying, hey, there's a problem. Here's some constructive guidance of how to resolve it. Now, let's take a quick look at some of the management packs that we've built in here. You can see all of these different management packs that I have on the left here covering pretty much every Microsoft service and application. In fact, I've added 273 different management packs here. So I have, a, I have quite the management server here. Now, even though I don't have a lot of these roles installed, like I don't have a link server, I can still add the management pack now if I want to go and monitor it later. We also have the ability to include third-party management packs, public cloud management packs. So there's management packs for Windows Azure to monitor our apps up there. And there's management packs for VMware. There's management packs for a whole lot of different components. And we're going to spend a little time later looking at some of our VMware management capabilities. When we look at our reporting, we have the ability to actually go and generate reports based on information, such as the health of our virtual machines, SQL servers, uh, and a variety of other Windows Server components. And that's kind of the quick overview of Operations Manager. Now, I teased you a little bit about Advisor already. So I'm just going to quickly show you how Advisor integrates with an Operations Manager. Now again, System Center Advisor is our free best practice analyzer that runs in the cloud. It's an Azure-based service, and essentially it goes and scans your data center, uploads the information to Azure in a secure form. Azure will go and analyze it and figure out what best practices you're not following. So in this case, I have an unsupported SQL server being used by VMM. I may not have known that, but this best practice analyzer is kind of prepping me to ensure that I'm going to be running a fully supported, fully functioning system. And you get to see these same type of interfaces, assigning it to different users. And you can even go and actually launch the specific KB article that will take you directly to the resolution. Now, in this example, I'm actually in an isolated lab environment. So if I went and actually clicked on that button, it's not going to take me to Internet Explorer. but I've just saved all of these uh, different advisor solutions offline. So for example, the alert SQL Server file initialization feature is not loading, goes and takes me to the knowledge article of how to fix that. So we're not just saying there's a problem. We're saying there's a problem, and we're giving you guidance on how to fix it. Now, Internet Explorer is performing a little slow, but I'm sure you guys trust me that we can load a website here. Let's switch back to the demo and move on to our next application. Next, we're going to look at Data Protection Manager. DPM is essentially our backup and restore utility. Now, the way uh, Data Protection Manager works is we can backup at the host level and the VM level, and in many cases, at the application level. 
The key consideration here is if you're backing up a specific application, you want to ensure that there's a VSS writer available for that application. VSS is our volume shadow service. Basically, what VSS does is when you say, I want to take a backup of this component, it speaks to VSS. VSS will then go and flush out anything that's needed to make that backup, what we call consistent. So if you have open file handles, um, information in the uh, file system buffer, information in memory, it flushes that out so you have basically a complete backup, and then takes the backup, and this way when you actually restore that backup, you're going to make sure there's no corruption, no incomplete information. It guarantees that uh, consistency. So we back up our different applications, and with many of these, we could even do item level recovery. So if you're backing up an exchange server, you want to recover just a specific mailbox, we can extract just that one mailbox. Now, as far as backing up our virtual machines and our services, let's go over to my lab and uh, we'll take a quick look at the DPM interface and how that exactly looks and feels. So I'm just going to launch DPM here. I'm going to connect to it. Provide my password. And what we'll see is our DPM interface running. Oh, had an unplanned shutdown. That's OK. Launch DPM quickly. And our DPM essentially allows us to organize our different components. Now, the way we back up our different components using Data Protection Manager is what we call a protection group. A protection group is kind of a logical organization or unit. So you might want to put all of your uh, Hyper-V virtual machines in a protection group your hosts in a different one, your system center components in a different one, and maybe your applications in a different one. So you see that you kind of have a lot of flexibility here with how you go and create protection. So I've already gone and configured a disk. So you can see I have this one disk here. It's got 100 gigabytes free. We go to see that we have no alerts, no problems right now. So let's go ahead and configure protection. To go create a new protection group, we say new. Then we go get to define the settings and actually specify what components we want to back up. On the protection group wizard, it'll tell us essentially what's happening under the covers. We get to pack back up servers or clients. We'll back up our servers. And then this is where we get to go and browse the different servers which we have an agent installed on. So for example, if I want to take a look at Operations Manager, I'll expand that. It's going to give us the option to go back up our Hyper-V components or our SQL databases. Now, in this case, I have the Hyper-V role enabled. I do not have any VMs deployed on it. So when we see the view once that expands, we're going to be able to back up the host, but not any individual VMs. Once we have those, we can back up the VM. Likewise, we have the ability to go and back up each of our System Center components. So down here, back up my Hyper-V host, back up my uh, SQL servers for System Center. So as I look here, I have my Operations Manager database for System Center. And uh, let's just back that up for now. Back up that one component along with our Hyper-V host. So we can click Next. We'll give this a name. We'll say this is my SCOM protection group. I can select disks. And I even have the option to go and back up to the cloud. So we could go and even push our data into Windows Azure if we need to scale up our data center further. Confirm how long we want to keep the data, when we want to perform the backups, and go ahead and select the various options here to go and complete this backup. So we see I only need three megabytes. I have 100 gigabytes. Not a problem. Back it up now. Some other consistency check-in features. Create the group, and our backup has now started. So DPM, it's not the most feature-rich backup utility, but it gets the basics done for your Windows Server systems, computers, virtual machines, and various data center components. Now next, we're going to go take a look at System Center Service Manager. System Center Service Manager, we really see kind of used for two core functionalities. The first is traditional IT service management. So System Center Service Manager is built on top of ITIL, uh, the IT infrastructure library, 
and MOF Microsoft Operations Framework for kind of a consistent help desk experience. You get things such as your uh, work items, your library items, your problem management, release management, incident management. So kind of the traditional help desk ticketed and asset tracking capabilities. The second key functionality we have is offering IT as a service. This is another self-service portal that is fully customizable, yet doesn't require any coding or any scripting. We go to a web portal, our self-service portal, and then we have access to different type of requests. For example, I need to get access to VPN. My virtual machine is running slow, speed it up. And so we often get asked, you know, OK, you have Virtual Machine Manager's app controller for VM self-service. What's kind of the difference between self-service through Service Manager? Well, the big difference is this is built on top of Service Manager. App controller is built on top of VMM. App controller scope is much limited. It's really designed just to do basic virtual machine management and provisioning capabilities. Deploy a VM, adjust it, uh, put it on premise, up in the cloud. Service Manager, you can do literally anything. The catalog is customizable, provide any type of request. I think the what key thing there, as you said, is, is the request. So I could request through Service Manager, but I consume through App Controller. That's correct. That's the, yep. key, that's the key difference, is if I need to be able to ask somebody for something, Service Manager is a good way to do that through that menu of options that Simon has, has posted on that portal there, that the, the request offerings and service offerings as part of the service catalog. But alternatively, if once I've requested something, IT may say, yeah, dev team, we've provisioned you a couple of new VMs, access them through App Controller. Alternatively, you may not be bothered about the request side of it, and you may just say, we've provisioned, you may email IT directly and say, I need some new VMs. IT say, yeah, we've spun them up, they're available in App Controller. So IT and, and dev have a slightly different relationship there. But it's up to you. It's all about requesting, though, from a, an IaaS perspective. Great clarification, thanks. Now, we also wanted to build an integration with Service Manager. So we have this concept known as connectors, allowing us to pull data from Active Directory, like our different users, groups, and computers, data from Config Manager, Operation Manager, Virtual Machine Manager, and then Orchestrator. What's really great about Orchestrator, which is our automation engine, is its ability to go and tie in any of these processes. So if you go and create a self-service request, someone completes the request, we can then go and trigger an automated workflow. So you don't even need administrative involvement. Somebody says, I want to go and scale up my virtual machine. They fill out the form, provide the necessary parameters, such as what's the name of the VM, what's the domain, what, uh, how big do you want to scale it to. We take those parameters, inject it into our workflow, and we can automatically go and complete that service request. Service Manager also contains a lot of rich reporting, business intelligence. It has its own data warehouse. It has a configuration management database. So it really has a great way to kind of centralize information and processes. But more importantly, how they're connected to each other as well. So for example, let's say you're doing a uh, release update. You want to update one of your networking switches. Well, taking that offline is going to cause a problem. What Service Manager does is it allows us to show the relationship for that particular networking component, the servers that are connected to it, the VMs that route through it, the services that it will affect, the users it will affect. So you can really understand across your whole IT infrastructure the impact of making a change to that particular component. So System Center Orchestrator, this is one of my favorite new components. It allows us to, it really opens up the doors to what we can do in our data center. I kind of like to talk about three big benefits here. First, I like to think about graphical scripting. A lot of these individual icons here you see are essentially PowerShell commandlets that are wrapped up and presented in an easy to consume format. A lot of people have trouble with scripting if they don't have any development background. Things just like running a for loop, you know, ah, oh, what exactly does that mean? How, how do I write that in PowerShell? Well, using this graphical engine, we take a lot of that logic out for you. You simply copy activities across, connect the dots, and then you go and trigger this workflow through a variety of methods. One way could be through Service Manager. People fill out the information. What's the name of my VM? How big do I want to scale it to? And again, we take those parameters, and we perform that task automatically. Second big piece of this is, of course, automation, what it's designed for. Automation gives us the benefit of speeding up time. And it also helps avoid mistakes. 
One challenge that we see a lot of customers have if they have to do a long series of manual steps, like create a multi-tiered VM service, is if they forget just one step, the VM might not work, it will have performance issues, and then they spend even longer troubleshooting it than it would have done just to rebuild it from scratch again. So we're trying to eliminate a lot of that confusion by building automation, saving time, so that we're really trying to free up your time to work on new projects rather than the same kind of standard repetitive task again and again. Cluster patching being one of the most popular scenarios people use Orchestrator for. They don't have any of those other utilities. Third big advantage of Orchestrator is its ability to go and connect diverse systems. We can literally connect to any system, any service that has a programmatic interface. So what is a programmatic interface? PowerShell, API, a script, uh, a function, basically anything that we can speak with across any standard protocol like SOAP or REST or HTTP, we could go and speak to that system. Now, the big advantage of Orchestrator is this ability to go and connect those diverse systems. The way we do that is through this concept known as our data bus. The data bus essentially takes some object, let's say it's an Oracle database. It takes that entry from an Oracle database, converts it into plain text as a string, or if it's a number, puts it as a regular integer, copies that information over this data bus to our SQL Server, for example. SQL Server is able to read it as the string or as an integer, inject it into its own database. So using this VM bus and translating these different components through plain text, uh, we're really able to connect any diverse system that has a programmatic interface. So we often see this used for things such as migration from you know, uh, VMware over to Hyper-V, build an automated workflow. Migration from maybe you have BMC Remedy as your ticketing system. You want to move over to Service Manager. Well, continue using BMC. As a new ticket request comes into BMC, take the information out, copy it across to Service Manager, add it to Service Manager. So you can use Orchestrator and position it as a way to connect these new systems throughout a migration as well. A lot of great features, and we're going to demo this one a little later as well. Now, as we wrap up this module, before we then move to our next, uh, after the break, I want to remind you of a few great courses provided by Microsoft Learning here. We have official curriculum courses and, of course, certifications that give you something tangible to use at the end of it. Now, with this particular course, it's a five-day course, instructor-led, and also contains a hands-on lab. You also have the ability to go and buy the course online and do your self-taught version, where we give you access to the content, access to the VM, so you can kind of train yourself. All of this put together, hopefully with this training, along with other trainings on the Microsoft Virtual Academy, can lead you down this path for our Microsoft certification. Server virtualization with System Center and Hyper-V. Well, with that, we're going to wrap up this module. We're going to be back in 10 minutes, and when we return, we're going to look a little more at System Center. Specifically, we're going to look at some hybrid cloud scenarios and then VMware management. So we're going to look at how we can monitor VMware with Ops Manager, how we can manage it with Virtual Machine Manager, and how we can even automate it using System Center Orchestrator. We'll be right back. <laughs> 